Okay, well, yes, good morning. I'm Pastor Dwight, and um, Pastor Mark did ask me, how do I do two jobs full-time? <laughs> um, I delegate a lot out, and actually, Ephesians 4 talks about how we're, the ministers, we're really to train and equip the, the saints to do the ministry. So, mm -hmm. I think it's a fallacy of the American church, I'm not trying to see bad things about the American church, but they, everybody wants to leave it up to the professional, to the pastor, to do all the ministry, when actually it's, you guys are all ministers, and um, sometimes I, I've started a message where I say, put your hand up if you're in full-time ministry, you know, and um, how many are in full-time ministry here? Everybody should have their hand up. I didn't say paid full-time ministry, but we're all in full-time ministry. So that's kind of how, and with PMA, really, I'm part-time, and um, Simone is full-time, but we have hundreds of volunteers to do the prison ministry all across the country, and then we're in 28 different countries. And it's kind of cool to be able to be here. It's my first time at this church, but many of you knew Ada Mason, Joe Mason's wife. And Joe is the founder of Prison Mission Association. So um, I'm sure Ada must have talked about it. I never got the chance to share with you guys about that. But um, I want to thank you for supporting. And so Joe Mason started back in 1955. Mm -hmm. So um, next year we're celebrating 70 years of, of proclaiming the grace message. So all the lessons are rightly divided. They're all mid-acts dispensational lessons. So. They're really well done, well put together, so if you've not seen them, um, I do have an introductory lesson over there that you can pick up. Um, it's just a one-page one that you can photocopy, and actually this is a really good evangelistic tool that you can use to share the gospel. <laughs> and um, we love Robert Nix and Linda, it's great to see them today. And so we partner, we work together with them too, and on the top here you'll see that if you do complete all 35 of our lessons, they're willing to give six credit hours, elective hours, uh, at the Bream Bible Institute. And I don't know that anybody's actually taken us up on this yet. Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge either, and we should know. <laughs> but you don't have to be an inmate to, to have that offer. So, and um, anybody can study the Bible, and uh, this, this is excellent. In fact, when I was at, um, I forgot the city in Pennsylvania, but I was at this church, and their pastor, anybody that he leads the Lord, this is their discipleship program. Anybody in their church, he takes them through the PMA lessons because it gets them really grounded in the Word, understanding the Bible. So it's something that you can all take advantage of, and the materials are, are fantastic. So um, I wish I could have brought my wife. I've been married 43 years now. Darlene, I met her in Australia on a missions trip. And then I came back the following year and worked with Andy, I don't know if you know Andy and Janine Hollier. And then uh, Pastor Ross Graham. So I served for 20 years in Australia with Grace Ministries International. And um, so I got, so part of me, you know, is involved in evangelism and discipleship and church planting. So it kind of fit in well when I started doing this prison ministry that we, our focus now is not, a lot of prison ministries will just parachute in on a Sunday or once a month. Um, but then who, who does ministry the rest of the time? <laughs> So I saw this as a, the most spiritually fertile harvest field on the planet. They're really interested. They got time to study the Bible. And we call it the greenhouse effect. Actually, I wrote a whole paper on that, of, of planting churches in the prison. So our goal is to develop the leadership from within and develop those, or you could call it micro churches or house churches. It's a little different than your traditional church, but the ones in the prisons. And so um, that's the exciting um, developments that we're seeing here at PMA and expanding the ministry, and I'm decentralizing it too, because the first year I got started, we doubled the number of lessons mailing out, and then Karen Bedoich, who's our operations manager, she said, well, Dwight, we got we, you've done good, we can't handle any more, this is it, like, I can only handle 100 new students a day, that's all I can enter into the computer, we don't have the manpower to correct any more lessons, so that's when we decentralized. So now I have 60 BCFs, we call it Bible Correspondence Fellowships, they duplicate what the Home Office does, so, we can give you all the masters of all the lessons. Instead of mailing it to Port Orchard, it gets mailed to your local church, or you may have your own post office box. So that's how we're doing it in 28 different countries and 60 different groups around the USA are doing that. And so it's a great opportunity where you can do prison ministry right from your kitchen table. You don't have to go into the prison. All you need is your Bible, and we give you the answer keys too, and you can just correct the lessons. You can mentor them, disciple them, pray for them, and, 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 and do that. So. Sorry about that long introduction there, but I want to give you a little bit 
of the introduction about PMA, and uh, but it's so important as we understand that as we, we do follow the Apostle Paul, and you know, he was the very first to start a prison ministry in the New Testament. And he worked from the inside, though. I get to go home at night, but he, he was actually in there. Uh, but he used the Word of God, and he wrote letters that were sent out to those early church believers, and that circulated. And you may have heard that the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, we want to combine both, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and the pen. So we're writing the inmates, we're mentoring them, and sending them letters of encouragement, which is a new thing, too, that I started. Um, besides the lessons, then we write a letter of encouragement, whoever's the, the, the lesson um, instructor that's, that's guiding them can pray for them and mentor them. And so it's a great opportunity. And um, just to illustrate kind of the power of the gospel and what how that transforms lives, what I used to show to illustrate what PMA lessons do is I use this, it's, I, I renamed it actually, Life Transformation by the Gospel Color and Input, because it used to say magic color, but it's not magic, okay? But the Life Transformation by the Gospel Color and Input. So, if, I don't know about, is anybody here like color and input? I know my wife likes to color and Okay, there's a couple people here. So, if you bought this book, you'd probably want your money back. <laughs> It's not a very good color and in book, but it's blank. So a lot of people don't really have any purpose or understand the meaning of life, and they've never read the Bible. They know zero. And so that's what a lot of the people in the inmates, one actually told me in Oak Park Heights, this maximum security prison, he said, I never would have heard the gospel unless I got arrested and came to prison because everybody I was running with, no one knew God. And it took that opportunity. And so he was thankful that he got caught and he went to prison because he got to know the Lord. So... The problem is then they have no purpose to mean to life. But once they get the lesson and they start to learn and to grow, then they get an opportunity to understand what the Word of God is talking about. But it's got to move from their head to their heart. Pardon? Oh, I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> but then once it moves it from your head to your heart and it transforms them, and uh, when they understand the grace message, then the, the Bible comes alive. And it really is. And so this isn't magic. It's the pages are shaved. Okay, so if I hold my thumb at the bottom, they're blank. Hold my thumb at the top, there's the outline. And if I hold it in the middle, it's color. Okay, so it's not magic. Anybody can do it. They're like $9.95 on Amazon. So if you want to. But uh, I know most people aren't supposed to tell their secrets, but I don't want you to think I'm doing magic or anything. But that's that's the opportunity that we have. So so the message I have for you today is really, really important. You have a great pastor here, Mark Dilley. Um, we, we, we sat through a lot of classes together. <laughs> and uh, Some amazing teachers that we had back then, like Dr. Sam Benton and things like that at Grace Bible College. And so you have a great church, a generous church, a loving church. I'm glad that you guys are, are saving all of those biblical uh, Bible studies like the Berean Searchlight and things like that. So when we mail out packets... We do that bulk mail, you get 3.2 ounces. So oftentimes the lesson might only weigh like one and a half or two ounces. So you have another ounce or two. So we try to get the full maximum. We have scales there, we're weighing them and we max them out, you know, to the full amount. So we can add a Berean searchlight, uh, daily bread, other Bible studies. We can add additional resources for the inmates. So I really appreciate that. So why is it important to have a church here at Sun City? And why is it important to have grace churches that rightly divide? Why is there a need for more grace churches? I, I have a real burden. I planted churches in Australia. I have a burden to see grace churches planted here in the U.S. I served for 20 years in Australia, helped with um, develop the Grace Theological College there and develop training of the local Australians to plant churches. And so why is it important for us to have more grace churches in America and around the world? Why is there a need to plant churches in the prisons? Well, to begin to answer that, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans 16, Romans 16, 25 to 27. Romans 16, 25 to 27. It says, Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings of the command of the eternal God 
so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever and ever through Jesus Christ. Amen. So in Romans 16, 25, we have the key passage to the message, not only to the message today, but to every message that's preached by anyone that teaches the Bible rightly divided, correctly handling the, the word of truth. And 2 Timothy 2.15 says, uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, but who correctly handles the word of God or rightly divides the word of truth. So our message should always be the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now this mystery we often call the grace message. And by the grace message, we mean that distinctiveness of Christ's revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul. And that in Christ and Paul's writings, we have the letters addressed to us, the body of Christ. And the entire Bible is written for us, but it's not all written directly to us. Mm -hmm. So not all the directions and the commands as you read in the Bible are applicable for us today. And so the fact that God gave a lot of different directions, you know, to Noah, to build an ark, uh, Moses different instructions and dietary laws and all the different things to you know, Abraham and all these different things so we have to understand the Bible though dispensationally and so we call it the grace message since it's the message for us today in this dispensation of grace or administration of grace and Paul says this in Ephesians 3 1 to 6 he says for this reason I Paul the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you that is the mystery made known to me by revelation, and I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was made known to men in other generations, was not made known, sorry, to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to the God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So understanding this message, this good news, according to the revelation of the mystery it's given to the Paul, is the key that unlocks all the scriptures for us. Now it doesn't mean we throw out anything that Paul didn't write, because in 2 Timothy 3.16 he says, All scripture is inspired, all scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. But when we understand the mystery and how everything fits together, the Bible <coughs> just comes alive. You know, if you remember when you first got to understand that, how exciting it was, and a lot of those apparent contradictions that you saw, and how those all things, how it all fits together now is amazing. And so it really helped me clear up, because I had a lot of questions before I really fully understood the grace message. I had questions about speaking in tongues, water baptism, and all those things. And so it really helps clear up a lot of that confusion. And so with the PMA lessons, it would really help people clear up a lot of the confusion that they have too, if you can um, use those in your ministry, and that we're using them and really helping disciple and mentor people. So we're to proclaim grace to everyone. So what does that mean? What's the implications? And so I'd like us to look, the key passage for today is Colossians. So turn to Colossians 1, 24, and it's a chapter 2, verse 5. He has verse 25, but um, let me just put two dots here. We'll fix that. In case you thought it was just two verses, maybe it should be just two verses, but I've got, got that whole section here. But I think this, these five implications really will help us to get that inner desire, the motivation, understanding of how important this ministry is and the ministry that we're doing here at West Valley Grace Fellowship through the Grace Gospel Fellowship. We have our pastor's conference this week up in Phoenix and the ministries through all the different mission organizations that you guys support and, uh, and PMA included. So if you have your sermon outline, the first blank that you're filling in is our distinctive message of grace, it's worth suffering for. Worth suffering for, and that's verse 24. So if you look at Colossians 1, 24, Paul says, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. So for sake of the body, the church, Paul was willing to suffer. And man, if you read the list of things, he, he, he went through a lot. 
of trials and tribulations, nothing like anything that we've ever faced. And, but he's saying here, he's not saying that Christ's sufferings was not enough. He's not saying the cross was insufficient when he's, because that was finished. Christ finished that work. But what he's saying is that, and actually if you back up into Colossians 1, 19 to 20, Paul says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, maybe today you're not at peace with God, and you've never accepted or trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you need to seriously consider that and, and, and accepting that gift of eternal life by grace through faith and understanding that. And there'll be no greater joy that you can have. And that's really the whole purpose of the grace message is for us to understand that peace and that joy that we can have and the, the, that love and that forgiveness that God provides us. That grace of God reaches out to each of us. And so we need to take a hold of what he's offering to us. And verses 19 and 20 talk about salvation, but when we get to verse 24, it's not speaking about salvation. We're not suffering there to get saved, but it's for service. We're, we're, in fact, Paul says in Philippians 1.29, he says, For it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. I, I don't like that verse, but there, it's in there. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if you've ever suffered for Christ, have you ever suffered for the sake of the gospel or the grace of God? It's easy to stay comfortable and think of not even going, having any suffering and just always taking the easy path. Sometimes we may need to, to stand up for the Lord. We may need to, to suffer uh, for the sake of the gospel. And the example of Paul and Christ's lifestyles and their priorities, they put the gospel first. And, um, and, and, and we're willing to go with that and be suffered. And, and, to take that suffering. Now, there's many places in the world that are suffering right now for the sake of the gospel. A lot of places in communist countries and places where they're, uh, it's horrible, where they're beheaded and imprisoned and tortured uh, for Christ, uh, for their faith. So many people are going through very many difficult times. And so we, we, we here have it so easy. We need to think about, you know, how much important it is for us to get this message out that we're willing to go and do whatever it is. This is the glorious message of the grace of God. It's not only worth suffering for, but number two, point number two, it presents God's word in its fullness. Fullness is the blank, if you're filling in there. And that's verses 25 and 26. Paul says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. So Paul became a servant to the church to present God's word in its fullness. And it's unique. It's a distinctive message that was given to the Apostle Paul. See the phrase, God gave me, is unique. And he declares the fullness that's found in the mystery. Now, when Paul was teaching and preaching, people had the Old Testament. They didn't really have the New Testament. But now we have the full, the full and completed scriptures. Uh, just to illustrate... That I'm going to take, actually, I'm not going to destroy my sermon outline. I'm going to do this one here. <laughs> so that, just a way to illustrate the importance of this is I'm going, to, I'm going to tear this into three parts. So individually, if you just read this, you couldn't really get the whole picture. Um, you need the whole piece. So, so in the Old Testament, like Daniel... Isaiah, all those prophets, they were given the, the, king, the kingdom message. And so they knew this is the beginning part of the Bible. And then we've got Revelation, and we talked about the, the dealings with Israel at the end of the Bible. But in the middle, we've got the, the mystery that was revealed to the Apostle Paul. So without that, it doesn't really make sense in understanding the distinctiveness that the Apostle Paul talked about, how the Jew and Gentiles would become one body in the body of Christ. And then how his plan in Romans 9, 10, 11, he set aside the plan for Israel. It's Israel, Israel will be set aside, but then they would be restored and be his people again at the end. And so until you really understand that and rightly divide those, those three sections, understanding prophecy and mystery, the prophecy of the, of the kingdom program, and then the mystery of the body of Christ, 
it really, really is important. And so it really helps us to understand God's word in its fullness. So that's the, that's the second point there. So it's worth suffering for. It presents God's word in its fullness. And then number three, it's necessary to teach and make known. That's verses 27 and 28. It says, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. So these are the glorious riches of the mystery. And it's very deep. It's, it's riches, is, it's plural. There's a lot there. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this might be better translated as one commentary said, which is Christ among you, the Gentiles. This was the first time that the Gentiles had heard this glorious message of the mystery, that they would be fellow heirs and partakers in the, of the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 3, 6 says, This mystery is through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together in one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. And then verse 28 of Colossians 1 there, it says, verse 28 says, We proclaim him, Christ, teaching in all wisdom, so we present everyone perfect or mature in Christ. Now, everyone stresses the need for evangelism and world missions. And I'd like to share with you a, a little parable that the Lord put on my heart a few years ago as I was traveling. Actually, I was in Michigan, and the Lord put this on my heart. Now, a few years ago, I had problems with my back. And it limited what I could do. Very difficult, very painful. I would be taking like 10 Advil at night to try to sleep, and I'd only sleep for about two hours or something. I couldn't get more than two hours of sleep at night. Anyway, and the doctors thought maybe it was arthritis. There's all these different issues. So I don't know, does anybody here have back pain or arthritis? Okay. My wife's got really bad arthritis in her hands and her knees and her back. Anyway, so I needed surgery. Anyway, so I got the back surgery, and praise the Lord, it, my back has gotten much better since that time. But wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a low-cost cure for arthritis? I mean, a really, a really effective cure that would just take away all that ugly pain. Um, and um, how many of you know someone that suffers from arthritis? Pretty much everybody, right? Yes. So when we have compassion on the sick, we want to help them to get better. We want to help them to recover, get the full strength. So suppose you knew a group of people that had discovered a cure for arthritis, but they were keeping it to themselves. How would that make you feel? Would you get mad? I'd get a little angry because my wife really suffers with it. I know I would not be happy if I'm suffering, and I knew that there was a group of people that had the cure for what my wife was suffering with. And then you find out that the cure for arthritis they have is totally free. It could be available to anybody, no matter your race, age, geographic location, your economic situation, that that could be made available and accessible to everybody. Wouldn't you bother, wouldn't it bother you <laughs> if these people had such good news and they'd be keeping it to themselves? And then you'd ask yourself, do they really care about people? Do they really care about those people that are hurting and they're suffering when they've got the cure, but they're not sharing it? And then you find out the cure that this little group has, it's not just the cure for arthritis, it's the cure for everything. <laughs> Any infection that ever affected mankind and in every terminal disease, no one would have to die. And in fact, it's beyond a physical, it's, it brings spiritual healing and wholeness and eternal life. And how would that make you feel? You'd want to shake up this little group, say, hey, wake up. You know, you've got the, the gift that you can share with these people that are hurting, that are suffering. And by now, I'm sure you figured out this little group that I'm talking about is us. It's the Christians. It's the church of God. We've been given the message of grace, this glorious message. And we have the cure for sin, not just one kind of sin, but every sin. And, and, and that cure is found in the gospel of the grace of God. And think about the price that Christ paid on the cross for our sin. And so we need a passion to get that message out for what Christ has done for us. And those people that are hurting, that are heading to hell forever and ever, um, Jesus absorbed all of that pain so that they wouldn't have to suffer. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So as you think about that, 
that, that what Christ has done for us that's really got to motivate us to, hey, we need to get out of our comfort zone, get over ourselves and know what's really, really important and, and the priorities need to be important of getting out the grace message. And so now is the time. We need to seize this moment in time and there's so much fear going on in our culture and, and, and so many d difficulties that our people are having and financially and physically. And the church, those of us in this room, we can make a difference. We have the power of God. We have the Holy Spirit. And um, God wants to transform and use uh, our message to, to, to make a difference, eternal impact. So I want to encourage you to surrender your time, surrender your money, surrender your talents to get this message out around the world. And it's so important if, to be effective in evangelism and in our outreach. Now, what's, what's the most effective form of evangelism? It's not mass evangelism. It's not TV, it's not radio, it's not internet, it's not literature. Something like 75 to 85% people are reached through a friend or a relative. So relationships are a key. And I have a little cartoon in your outline there if you look at it. There's two groups of people here. There's the church people that are scratching their head there thinking, why don't these people come to our meetings? Actually, you guys, this is almost packed out. There's only a couple empty seats here, so I'm impressed. So you have, a, you have a pretty good attendance here. But look on the other side. There's the people over on the other side. They're saying, why don't those people ever talk to us? So what do you think is needed? Because there's some sharks in the water between these two islands. They need to build a bridge. Yeah, a bridge of relationships. And that's ministry flows through relationships. If you haven't made a relationship with an unsaved person, you can't have any ministry. You can't share the gospel. So that's the number one thing. You need to build a bridge. Find something in common. Join a club or talk to people at the street or where you buy gas or if you buy to go to a coffee shop. Build relationships with those people and share with them and share them of them the grace message, what God has done in your life. So that's really the key. What we need there is to build relationships. That's what's missing. So my heart is aching for the lost and, and the passion that we need to have that God has given us so much. We are so blessed, so much. And um, we need to do, we need to take that next step of sharing the gospel. And um, it says that we're to make this clear to everyone, everyone. And um, that includes the prisoners, that includes the inmates. So I don't know if you have a jail nearby here or a prison. Um, they're not gonna be able to come to your services. Okay, they're locked up. <laughs> so you need to go to them, and that's part of the problem. I think the church thinks the people need to come to us. And that's why I use that cartoon. They think these people should come here, but we actually need to go to them. You know, God's never taken go out of the gospel. We need to take it to them. So the opportunities there is to do prison ministry from your kitchen table. And uh, so if you're interested in doing something like that, you know, you can talk to me afterwards. I would love to talk to you about how we can set up your own Bible Correspondence Fellowship and do something here in reaching out to your community of jails and prisons that you have right here. And I, there's a lot of prisons in Arizona. Um, so there's a huge, huge mission field there. And so, so how do we do it? How do we do this? It's worth suffering for. It presents God's word in its fullness. It's necessary to teach and make known. So how does God expect us to do it? Well, verses 29 to chapter 2, verse 1, we read this. Paul says, To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those in Laodicea and for all those who have not met me personally. So it's a struggle. That's the next blank there. Number four, it's a struggle, but we work in God's energy, not relying on our own, not mine, but Christ, which powerfully works in us. So, is God powerfully working in you, is a question. Why or why not? So, and that's why I'm always trying to evaluate that and how I can improve, how can I train and delegate and get more people fired up with the gospel and multiply yourself. That's really what we need to be, to be disciplers and multipliers, mentoring other people. And that's at 2 Timothy 2, 2, power of multiplication, where Paul trained Timothy, Timothy trained faithful, men to disciple other people and so that's what the ministry is all about 
So it's God's energy through the power of the Holy Spirit as we, we surrender to him and then we energize and disciple and mentor others to do that. And we see in chapter 2, verse 1, that Paul is struggling for them. He's teaching us by his example how important God's message is. Paul labored and suffered to get the gospel out. So I want you to challenge you and, um, to pray. That's really one of the most important keys, that, especially in Australia, where the people there, man, they didn't, need, they didn't think they needed God. They didn't go to church. Very few people believed in God. What did they need God for? <laughs> you know? So we had to break up that, those hard hearts by loving them and praying for them. And um, we did spiritual warfare praying, and that's a whole other sermon that I've done on um, how to pray for the lost and how to try to really open up and, and see them say. So I want to encourage you really to pray. Think of two or three people you know that don't know Christ as their Savior and start to really pray for them. And if you don't have two or three people that you don't, are not good friends with that don't know Christ, you don't need to, that's a first step, is find some people that you know, maybe your neighbors or friends or workmates, that you can pray for and start praying for them and that God would bring a breakthrough and God would use you to share the gospel of the message of grace. So, you know, a thousand years, it won't matter how much money you made here on earth, what kind of car you drove, what kind of house you had, what kind of computer you had, all this temporal things that get distractions and we get hung up on but really what matter is what you've done with god's word in your investment in reading and studying his word and then investment in people those are the two things that are eternal and so that's really what i have tried to invest my life into i want to encourage you to do that so pray for at least two or three lost people that you can mentor and talk to and share the gospel with then the final point i have here Paul shares that our distinctive message will encourage our heart. Encourage is the blank there. Encourage our hearts and unite us in love. And that's verses 2 to 5 of Colossians 2. Paul says, My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of a complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith is in Christ is. So you can actually change the they in there to our heart. Put your name in there. You know, that, that Dwight may be encouraged in heart and united in love. That Dwight may have a full understanding in order that Dwight may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. And that really brings us back to the beginning of the message when I shared about how knowing the grace message the uniqueness of the divine revelation given to the Apostle Paul is, really helps us teach the Bible in a clear, and un, it helps people really understand the Bible. And so that really encourages us when we understand the scriptures rightly divided, and we can encourage other people by doing this. And this grace unites us in love. And that speaks of the unity in the, the body of Christ working together mentioned in Ephesians 4. So as a result of experiencing God's grace, understanding the depth and significance of what Christ has done for us, how he saved us, how he's blessed us, given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, as Ephesians 1 talks about. That love's touched us, and now it overflows from us to those around us, and will make a difference. So by sharing God's grace, that will make a huge eternal impact. And I'd like to thank you for those that have prayed for PMA and supported us, that is, with, 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 for the many years the PMA has been doing this, and then when we get to heaven, we get the glory, there's going to be some inmates that might come up to you and say, hey, thank you for supporting PMA. Thank you for giving and for sharing, the, for enabling me to hear the grace message while I was in prison. So how many people will be in heaven to thank you for sharing the grace message, for sharing the gospel? And uh, so that, that's an important question to think about. What is really important in your life, what you're spending your time with, what you're investing your time with. And uh, so just to review my main points here, that our message of grace, it's worth suffering for. It presents God's word in its fullness. It's necessary to teach and make known. It's a struggle, but we are to work in God's energy, not in ours. And it encourages us in our hearts and unites us in love. So today, maybe you're a new Christian, maybe you're a, an old Christian or a mature Christian, but I challenge you, whatever, whatever you're at, 
in your spiritual life, in whatever job you're doing, you could be a truck driver, uh, a salesman, whatever your job is, God has called us to be his ambassadors in those areas of where you're serving. And God has chosen you to be that ambassador of the message of grace and to help share that word of God rightly divided. And uh, so I, I wanna encourage you guys to pray for the leadership here and your elders and the work that you're doing. And this, this community is hurting and they need to hear the message of grace. And so I pray, <coughs> pray for our missionaries and the grace message might continue to grow and um, that God might raise up more workers with PMA, we're, we're praying for um, a bilingual person to help us with the Spanish side. We have a new guy that just started volunteering. His name is Frank. He's a potential person to be that coordinator that we've been praying for. So, so pray for more laborers, more people to volunteer, and more finances with, with increase of paper and postage and all those things. And our increase of student body, everything costs go up. So, but God has continued to bless and provide for that in the ministry. So I really want to give you thanks uh, for your part in that and thank the Lord for how he is doing that. So let's just bow now and close in prayer. Lord God, I want to thank you for the wonderful good news that we have to share the message of grace. Thank you for allowing us to have a part in bringing people to salvation, that you use us as your mouthpiece, as your ambassadors. And I pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that they will recognize their sin and their need to trust in Him today. And may, may they maybe speak to the pastor or myself afterwards if, if they want to know more about how to grow in their faith. And there may be those who are here that have trusted in Christ, and I want them to take this challenge to proclaim the gospel of grace to everyone seriously and consider how we can get more involved. How can we be more creative? Think of ways I'm getting the message of grace out and that we can personally pray for the people that we know and developing friendships with the lost so that they could come to know Christ as their Savior. We pray all of this in the strong name of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.